Hello. Uh, so it's Sean, and uh, today I'm sitting down with my guest, uh, Sam, or as you can see, he's also known as Defenders of the Way. Um, and he actually uh, just corrected me of something. Uh, so he, for whatever reason, I had formally had the idea that he was Hebrew Israelite before this. He uh, informed me that he is a Nazarene Hebrew. Um, you know, he can explain the difference between those if he wants to. Uh, I don't know how relevant it is. Basically, the reason why I wanted to have him on today is because, and I guess let me just start out with asking you this, Sam. Um, this this uh, method of Bible study known as line upon line and precept upon precept, th is that that is one that you would hold to, that, yeah, that you would say that's how you understand Scripture? Absolutely. Okay. And would you, I don't know if you know, but would you say that your, um, th how you understand line upon line, precept upon precept, would that method be the same as that understood by the Hebrew Israelites? Um, it depends. Not every uh, Hebrew, uh, what you would uh, term Hebrew Israelite, uh, thinks the same. Uh, just as in uh, Christendom, uh, you have different uh, sects with varying, uh, you know, paradigms and theologies. Uh, the, the same applies here. Um, you have some that, you know, uh, do not have the understanding that I have uh, regarding uh, the biblical mandate of precept upon precept. Uh uh, many uh, Christians, as well as Hebrew Israelites, um, if you will, uh, you know, have a uh, misunderstanding of what the Bible, the biblical uh, prescription for Bible study is, and that is uh, precept upon precept. Okay, uh, so we can get more. Back so I wouldn't say that. I, I'm sorry. I wouldn't say that. I can speak for all uh, Hebrew Israelites. I cannot say that. I've seen a lot of Hebrew Israelites uh, uh, misapply, you know, the, the 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 concept and the precept of precept upon precept, if you will. Um, and I've seen uh, Christians, mostly Christians, but, you know, also uh, Hebrew Israelites as well. So is it fair to say then that there might be uh you know, um, two people might use that same phrase line upon line, but actually be utilizing it differently. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, and I uh, agree that everybody can do that with their particular methods. But uh, I guess I am kind of curious, uh, what would you say is maybe the starting point of the precept upon precept method? Like what, what, what would be your yeah starting point? Um, if you're asking for a starting point, um, I would go to Isaiah chapter number 28. I have it uh, here if I'm allowed to share my screen. Uh, see, I'm not sure if I, uh, I might have to do that for you, but let me see here. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Let me see. Well, you are presenting, so if it's cool. I mean, or we can read it, however you want to do it. Okay, give me one second here, because I lost you. Uh, okay. So I don't. Okay. Are you still, are you still there? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so. I think I figured it out here again. I do this and I forget. Let's see here. There we go. All right. It's coming up. Yep. So, okay, I have to go back one. Okay, or do I just exit out this? Let me go back one. Okay. So, here in this text in the book of Isaiah, Yasha Yahoo. Chapter number 28. Um, I, I'm i going to... Um, hmm. 
We're gonna start at uh I'll start at verse one. I'll read quickly. Woe to the cried of uh woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hell and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet, and the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower, and as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he looketh upon it, seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day, that day, shall Yahuwah Sabiath be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people and for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. Mm -hmm. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Key verses. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine, which is teaching? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast for precept is to precept precept upon precept line to line line to line here a little and there a little now this is where uh we get uh the understanding uh the the precept for uh studying the bible precept upon precept that's where we get the uh, precept from. Now, uh, it's also a scripture in 2 Timothy, which is a companion scripture to that, because I am a believer in uh, it takes uh, two or three witnesses. So now I just gave you the precept. Now I'm going to get the line. The line would be in 2 Timothy. Uh, the author, uh, whomever the author of 2 Timothy is, we want to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and I believe it is verse number 15, and we find there, uh, I'll just read that one uh, verse there, study to show thyself approved unto Allah, Hayim, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you take that word dividing and we do a very quick etymology uh, on that word divide or rightly dividing, it means to draw a line. It takes us back to uh, the precept, which is the, uh, the, the commandment in uh, the Old Testament, uh, which we call the Tanakh, uh, it's taking you back there. It's talking about that same line that was mentioned in the book of Isaiah. And so Isaiah gives us the precept and uh, uh, Second Timothy, whomever th this author is that wrote this book of Second Timothy, the second chapter and the 15th verse, uh, takes us back and builds upon that precept that we find in Isaiah chapter number 28. So 
that's where the beginning of it begins is right here in the Bible uh, found in the scriptures, which is the Old Testament Tanakh, uh, the precept of Isaiah. We find Isaiah, this is Isaiah speaking. Some of the critics say uh, that this is Ephraim that's mocking and, um, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, and that is the case in this uh, chapter. Uh, altogether. But here we find uh, uh, the speaker in Isaiah 28 and 10 is most certainly uh, Isaiah himself. And he's asking the question, whom shall he teach knowledge? So we know uh, that the context is one of understanding knowledge. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? We know uh, that the word doctrine uh, uh, etymolog etymologically breaks down to mean teaching or direction. And so this is the context, the immediate context of Isaiah chapter number 28 and verse 10. We could go back to Isaiah 27, Isaiah 26, and he's going to be talking about understanding. He's still talking about understanding the precepts and the doctrine, the teachings of the Most High. Uh, if you go to ver uh, chapter number 29, which sandwiches uh, chapter, this Isaiah chapter number 28, you will find the same principle there uh, of understanding, the same context, the same uh, idea, the same subject there is understanding uh, the, uh, uh, the precepts, the teaching, the doctrine of the Most High in preparation for the day of the Lord. So that's the context there. So that's where we get uh, precept upon precept. First of all, uh, I'm sorry, if you want to go ahead and I'll give you time enough to break in there. Did that answer your question? Um, uh, I well, I mean, yeah, it's good. It, it gives me a starting point. Obviously, I have, you know, kind of more follow up questions. So let me just run through some of these. And that's cool. We'll, you know, take it back and forth as need be. Um, now, okay. as far as defining like, you know, what is a precept would i be okay with just looking up the definition of precept in the dictionary or is there like a, a specific definition that you would put in place of that word good question uh a precept is not um it, 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 uh, the, let me put it this way the hebrew uh or the hebraic paradigm is based on the concrete is based on concrete concepts, uh, laws, and principles that you can touch, see, taste, hear, and feel. Um, you know, the Greek uh, is more abstract in that it's based on uh, uh, concepts, uh, laws, and principles that uh, do not have a concrete uh, basis to it. With that being said, uh, the question is in uh the uh the, the hebrew itself so in order to get the definition for what a precept is you can start off with your english dictionaries you can um you know uh take a look at your thesaurus and things like that and do your uh uh, uh english etymology or your your you know, Greek and Latin etymologies and things of that nature. But being as though this is Hebrew, uh, we have to go back to the original Hebrew. The, the Hebrew word for precept is the word saw. Uh, and it means an order or a command. I, I, I don't know if you can see this up on the screen, but that word saw means uh, an order or a command. So, the, the commandment must be co compared. And in the original language, let me see if I still have this up uh, here. I don't think that I do. Let me see. Let me go to my scripture, uh, scripture for all so I can get into the interlinear real quick. And we'll actually get to take a look at the actual Hebrew uh, and how that uh, breaks down. So we're at Isaiah chapter number. Yeah, just so you know, though, the web page you were just on does the interlinear too, but maybe you're accessing a different mm -hmm. one. Right, but they're interlinear. The uh, the uh, 
the uh, transliteration is okay. Uh, the translations are not that good, um, especially in the Hebrew, according to my instructor. Uh, and so uh, he suggested that I stick with this uh, scripture for all, which, um, you know, here the uh, transliteration, uh, 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 the translation is good. Uh, the transliteration is um, actually this one, the transliteration is not uh, that good. And the other one is. So I flip back and forward between uh, both of those, the Bible hub and uh, this scripture for all. Um, just because this is what I was, you know, trained on and think I'm just comfortable with it. And so anyway, we have here Isaiah chapter number 28, verse 10. Uh, it says that uh, uh, key saw, uh, saw, uh, saw, saw, uh, call, 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 uh, zoi, shim, zoi, shim. And so uh, here the word uh, instruction is what was uh, translated as that Hebrew word saw. And it means an instruction, a commandment, an order. Some of the translations, if we uh, go into the other translations, uh, it's going to say order, uh, commandment, uh, things of that nature. So a precept is a commandment. A, a order, a, uh, uh, a, a, an instruction. Uh, it, it's something that uh, doesn't change. I took the liberty to do, um, well, I, I, we haven't gotten to the principle yet, but as you see here, uh, the Hebrew word for, um, the Hebrew word for precept is saw, which means instruction or commandment. The Hebrew word for line is call, which means a principle. Um, and there is a difference between a principle and a, a law, if you will. So that's, uh, in other words, with uh, what uh, Saw is talking about is the law. If a precept is the law, a uh, precept is the commandments uh, that the uh, within the law that the law contains. A principle is uh, guidelines that you know uh, uh, illustrate. Uh, certain portions of the law, um, you know, so that is the difference. But here, a precept is the law, the commandment. In other words, in the biblical uh, standpoint, thus saith the most high. And so um, that's what the biblical definition of a precept is. And I believe it's the, the, the English definition as well. So, it sounds like <clears throat> that whenever you come to scripture and you're trying to understand a particular area, uh, you need to be looking for a precept and a line. Is that correct? Right. Well, it's not every time. Sometimes the meaning is apparent, but I'll give you a case in point. Uh, uh, Acts chapter number, uh, I have it here on my um, computer already. I'll pull it up for you. Um, case in point, the Apostolic Council and uh, versus Paul's uh, 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 paradigm on things offered to idols. Now, some of the folk uh, that don't like Paul, uh, you know, call him an apostate. This is what they use to say, see, see, you know, James told uh, gave specific commandments to the Gentiles in Acts chapter number 15 and verse 20. He says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now, what we're talking about here is things to abstain things, uh, abstain from pollutions of idols. Now, this is a commandment that was given at the Apostolic Council, which took place in 50 AD. Uh, James and Peter, uh, two of the apostles we know for sure were present, um, you know, and, uh, you know, the rest of the elders that were there, they uh, constructed a letter and gave specific uh, uh, orders regarding um, the Gentiles and what the Gentiles could and could not do. 
And one of the things that specifically James said uh, that was signed off on by Peter and, ag and agreed uh, to by Paul, in fact, Paul took the letter and, you know, dispersed it throughout Asia Minor to his uh, Gentile populace. And so uh, we have this issue here. We have this seemingly uh, contradiction as to what was given three years prior to Paul, three to four years prior to Paul penning 1 Corinthians. Three or four years, uh, give or take, uh, Paul was given uh, these commandments regarding his Gentiles that they must abstain from things offered to idols. It was said twice to Paul. It was said twice in Acts chapter number 15. Acts chapter number 15, verse number 20, and Acts chapter number 15, verse number 29. Uh, also, uh, three times, uh, well, actually, yeah, we have now. OK. And it was repeated again in Acts chapter number 21, verse number 25. So three times we have apostolic commandments coming directly from the apostles to tell the Gentiles that they must abstain, abstain from things sacrificed to idols. Right. So now here we have Paul four or five years later in First Corinthians chapter number eight and verse number four, uh, also uh, verses eight through nine. He says, as concerning, therefore, the, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other but one. But meat commendeth us not to the Elohim, for neither if we eat it. Now, here's Paul's prescription on uh, eating things sacrificed idols. Paul said, if we eat it, are we the better? Neither if we eat not, are we the worse? This is Paul's prescription. He also picked it up in 1 Corinthians 10th chapter uh, verses uh, 25, starting at verse 25. He said, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that, I, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Uh, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. So now these two things seem to contradict one another. What was said at the Apostolic Council in 50 AD and what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians in 53 to 54 uh, AD is two different things. Did Paul forget? Is Paul Was Paul lying and pretending to be a part of this council? Is Paul making up his own gospel, his own doctrine? Is he creating a new religion? Is he you know, setting his own autonomy. Is that what's going on? Separate from uh, those that the Mashiach himself left um, on the scene in, 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 in command, James being the head of the council there and Peter right along with him, the one that the, the, uh, the Mashiach gave the, the keys of the kingdom to. Is this what's going on? Now, see, this is where precept upon precept comes in. Because when you go through and find the precept and look for a precept dealing with abstaining from meats offered to idols, you won't find one. The reason being is because this is not a precept. It is a principle and part of a precept. Now, let me show you how to solve this problem using precept upon precept, because you, you'll have some Christians that say, see, see, Paul taught something different. He said we can eat things offered to idols. We can eat things with blood in it. We can do all of these things that the, the apostles, James and Peter themselves wrote a letter and condemned. So now is that the case? It seems like we have a discrepancy here to solve this problem. And the only way, well, the only way that I've found, let me put it that way. Let me not be uh, so presumptuous in, uh, you know, my statements. But the only way that I've found to solve this problem is I started to go to the precept. And I said, well, where do I find a law regarding eating things offered to idols. Is there a law that say thou shalt not eat things offered to idols? Is it? Uh, did James just make these things up? And now is he adding his own commandments or can I find this in Torah, in the law and the prophets? Can I find this anywhere in the law and the prophets? And I actually did. And when I went there, I couldn't find the precept what I actually ended up finding is 
the the uh, I didn't actually find a precept that says uh, that uh, says thou shalt not sacrifice things to idols. But I did find out that idolatry is the precept that covers eating things offered to idols. The, the, the context is idolatry. And once you understand that, it puts the this seemingly uh, uh, apparent contradiction in harmony. Because when we go to uh, Exodus, I believe it is, we want to go to Exodus chapter number 34. Let's see. Exodus chapter number 34. Now, this is how precept upon precept works. I don't know how I chose a whole nother uh a window or something here. I don't know what in the world is going on. But okay. And it says, um, uh, where do we want to read from? And the two tables, keeping mercy for iniquity and Moses. And he said, behold, here we go. Here we go. Um, and uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 34, I'm going to start reading verse number eight. And Moshe made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Yahuwah, let my Yahuwah, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth. This is what Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah 26, 27, 28, and 29, those marbles um, in the earth, nor in any nation and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of Yahuwah, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself. Here we go. This is the precept. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee but ye shall break down their altars break break their images and cut down their groves here we go for thou shalt worship no other allah for yahuwah whose name is jealous is a jealous allah lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land notice that word covenant being repeated in the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their allah and do sacrifice that word sacrifice when uh uh when you uh uh sacrifice unto their gods unto their uh Alahayims. and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice here's the precept lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land so there's a covenant involved and thou go a whoring after their gods and that's what the the meat uh, sacrifice idols when you break down the meat the meat goes back uh, etymologically to the covenant the covenant there was a sacrifice made the meat was parted in, in in two parts and the parties to the covenant would pass through the parted meat uh and 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 signifying if i break this covenant may i be parted like this meat so meat became synonymous with a covenant so the sacrificial meat became synonymous with a covenant. And so we cannot find a uh, thou shalt not eat meat sacrificed to idols, but we can find the precept that is contained under, that this principle is contained under, which is called idolatry. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their Elohims, Exodus 34, verse 15, and do sacrifice unto their Elohims, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of thy daughters unto thy sons, take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. 
And so this is the context. Uh, the context is a covenant through idolatry. When you make this sacrifice and you eat things, sacrifice to idols, you go and you partake in this uh, uh, a ritual uh, sacrifice and do all of that. You are joining yourself and making yourself a, uh, a, a covenant with that God with that false uh, Allah And so uh, the same thing was with uh, ancient uh, Israel, I Israel, ancient Israel, they understood that the sacrifices that was made, they were to be a partaker of it and that those sacrifices brought them into covenant relationship uh, with the most high. And so now when we understand that, like Paul did, see, Paul was a, a, a scholar in the law. Uh, uh, one of the greatest to ever do it. And so he understood this. He training under Gamaliel, being a Pharisee of the Pharisee, Paul understood the, 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 the concept and the precept of precept upon precept. So what he did was take John, uh, James uh, 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 principle and put it in its proper context and under the proper precept. And he said, listen, I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to prove to you through that text that Paul was using precept upon precept when he was given that order and that he was absolutely right and in accordance with Torah, 100 percent, in accordance to that which was written uh, by, uh, 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 by the, uh, the, the prophets and spoken uh, by the prophets, the law. And so if we go to prove that, we go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 10, where we find... Uh, where we find, I uh, just got out of that. First Corinthians chapter number eight. I think we're going to start at there. First Corinthians chapter number eight. And we're going to see if Paul placed this principle that seems confusion and uh, confusing and contradictory in its proper context and under his proper precept by using, he put it in his proper context by using the principle of precept. Um, the law of precept, actually. So uh, let's go to First Corinthians chapter number eight. Now, uh, you have a lot of Christians, a lot of folks, a lot of Hebrews as well. They want to go and get you a precept out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, all of these. They, 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 they want to go to these. That's not a precept. None of that is a precept. According to this book, a precept is the law. You got to go back to the book of the law, to, to, to the law and the prophets, that which was spoken directly out of the mouth of the Most High through his prophets. And so now we find uh, uh, Paul uh, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Um, I think it's 10 that I want here. Uh, yeah, it is. It's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Oh, I'm in 2 Corinthians. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So we want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, right? Okay. It say, moreover, brethren, I would not have ye that ye be ignorant, starting at verse one, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moshe in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, Allah Hayim was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our example to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters. Here we go. Here we go. Here, here, here's the context that people totally skip over that Paul himself understood and that we have to understand uh, in order to get uh, reconcile what James said with what Paul said. The only way to do that, that I found, if there's another way somebody can let me know, I haven't found it, uh, is precept. Going back to the precept, which the precept uh, uh, of eating meat sacrificed to idols is idolatry. 
It's in it's 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 when you're practicing idolatry. It's not when you're going to the supermarket and 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 unbeknownst to you, uh, some folk then the the the, the butchers then sacrifice to to some god or or they they didn't you know uh, 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 sacrifice uh, they didn't kill the meat like it was supposed to. You're not aware of that. That's not. You know, uh, uh, you uh, that you you're eating what was sold in the marketplace in the shambles at the supermarket, at the butcher shops. So uh, it, you're not partaking in idolatry in the sacrifice worship. And so when you put this in its proper context through the process of precept, watch it. Paul says, First Corinthians ten and seven: Neither be ye idolaters. And if you look in your Bible, I believe, because I'm not looking at the uh, the hard copy Bible, I'm on the screen here, it says against idolatry. That's the topic. It gives you the topic. It gives you the context of this 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and it's telling you that it's dealing with idolatry. Verse number seven, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Where is that written? Uh, we just read one, Exodus 34, uh, also Numbers chapter number 25. Ex Numbers chapter number 25 tell us that the people rose up, they sacrificed to the gods, they sat down and they eat. That, that's the second witness to the precept. Uh, numbers chapter number 25, we didn't go there yet, uh, but talking up and putting uh, putting eating of things sacrificed to idols in its proper context, which we do by finding the precept. And so Paul was doing the same thing here. Uh, verse number, let's drop down to uh, uh, verse number 11. Now all these things happen unto them for our example. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that think if he standeth take heed lest he fall. Therefore, have no temptation which is common to man. That's not. Here we go. Verse number 14. So we have verse number seven. Now, verse number 14, he's just going to let you know again that he's well aware of this precept uh, upon precept uh, uh, a principle. Uh, and this is what he's doing. First Corinthians 10 and 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, do what? Flee from idolatry. Once again, idolatry is being spoken of. Idolatry. This is the precept. So you won't find thou shalt not eat things sacrificed to idols. You won't find that in the scripture. Nowhere. I look. I've searched. Nowhere. So the only way for you to understand this is if you go to the precept, you go to Exodus chapter number 34, you go to Numbers chapter number 25, and it's telling you that this is in the practice of idolatry. It's not when you go to the supermarket and get meat that uh, you uh, that that uh, these folks then sacrifice uh, to idols. Uh, 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 like I said, I showed that first Corinthians 10 and seven, first Corinthians 10 and 14, wherefore my beloved flee idolatry again, setting the context. I speak as to wise men judge ye what I say, the, the cup of blessings, which ye bless, is it not the communion? There we go. There, there we go. The covenant communion of the blood of the Mashiach, the bread, which ye break. Is it not the communion of the body of the Mashiach? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat sacrifices, partakers of the altar. Now, is Paul schizophrenic here? Is he condemning them for eating of the altar and then telling them it's fine to eat it at the same time? Don't worry about it for conscience sake. No. How do you know that? You got to go back to the precept. And once you understand that the precept is talking about idolatry and that the principle uh, is there, the principle has to be put in its proper context. And the only way to do that is to find the precept, the law that speaks to this particular principle, this particular guideline, uh, this particular theory as to how we keep uh, uh, the, the precepts which is the commandments. Uh, uh, verse 18, behold, Israel at the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the, 
of the altar. So we're still talking about idolatry. Here we go again. What say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles, the Goyim sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to Allah. I would not. Here we go. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Fellowship, communion, covenant, make an agreement. That's going right back to that covenant that's in that text it, it, uh, dealing with idolatry. That when you uh, partake of these things that are sacrificed to idols uh, in, uh, during their ceremonies and you partake in these events, then you are joining yourself to these devils and these demons uh, who are uh, posing as uh, gods. And so uh, verse 21, ye cannot. Once again, he's telling you, you cannot drink of the cup of, of, of Adonai and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of Adonai's table and of the table of uh, devils. Once again, you can't sit down. You can't partake in idolatry. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, this should be, uh, you know, I, I hope hopefully I've made the case clear that, you know, Paul himself was using uh, precept upon precept. The, 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 the way that we understand the uh, uh, discrepancy that's been going on for thousands of years now, the argument that Paul uh, was an apostate, he wasn't an apostle, he was lawless, he was all of this nonsense that some of the Hebrew brethren say. Uh, you know, they, they, it's because, uh, like Peter said, folks stumble at the scriptures because they unlearn. And they unstable in the Old Testament, which is scriptures. The only scriptures that ever existed is the Old Testament. The New Testament is not scripture. The New Testament contains scripture. It's a historical and uh, letters, uh, apostolic letters that contain scripture in them. About one third of it is scripture, but they are not scripture. So when you understand these basic things, what is scripture? Scripture is the Old Testament. What is a precept, a law out of the Old Testament, out of the Tanakh, a law, a commandment that comes out of the mouth of the prophets or uh, that, or that we have written that was recorded of what they uh, spoke of. When you understand these things, when you understand that you must go back to the Old Testament and get that, you, you, you have to. You got to go get the precept and then the confusion disappears there. All right. Uh, let me uh, earlier you had mentioned about how you don't always use precept upon precept like if a passage is apparent. Now, would you say that the passage in Isaiah 28 you know, verses 9 and 10, would you say that that is an apparent passage or do you need to utilize precept upon precept to understand that scripture? Yes, I think it's, it's very apparent uh, due to the context. As I stated, let me get you the context. Isaiah chapter number 28. Uh, context is king. you got to get the context. You can't ignore the context. Uh, and this is what a lot of Christians and Hebrews do, uh, to be honest with you. They, they will totally disregard the context and just go take a scripture that seems like it's, it's agreeing with what uh, whatever doctrine or or principle, whatever that they're uh, proposing, and then they'll just throw that out there and mix a bunch of those together. That's not precept upon precept. Precept is when you do what I just did and you go get the law and you put the law in its proper perspective and you find out that there is no law against eating things sacrificed to idols, not a single one. There's a law of you going, sitting down, uh, partaking of the sacrifice, uh, you know, uh, 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 kneeling down to these guys and all that stuff, which is a part of their ceremonies and eating the meat sacrificed to idols. For instance, if I say, uh, listen, do not go to the bar and get drunk and then drive. Somebody can come and say, well, Sam said, don't drive at all. It's a sin to drive. It, it, Sam said it. It's, it's against the law. Sam is the lawmaker. That's what he said. I did say that, but it has to be put in its proper context. I said, do not go to the bar, get drunk, and then try to drive. So now, if people, you could take each one of those three things that I said and say, Sam said, don't go to the bar. It's a sin to go to the bar. But that's not what Sam said. Sam said, don't go to the bar, drinking to get drunk, and then drive. So you have to put all three of those things together. You know, uh, the, the principles 
uh, would be don't drink and drive, uh, don't go to the bar and get drunk. But the law says don't do all of these things together. That's what that's what the law states. So now if I go and get drunk, I haven't broken the law because I'm not driving. That the, 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 the intentions, the reason why Sam gave this commandment was so that you don't drink and drive and get arrested or kill yourself or kill someone else. That's the that's my motive. That's the the intent, the author's intended meaning. That's what the author of this law meant when I put it together. So for for someone to say Sam taught and I'm a student of Sam and Sam says you cannot go to the bar. I can show you right here. He wrote it down. He said, do not go to the bar. You see these words? Do not go to the bar. But they've taken totally out of context because what I said was, do not go to the bar, get drunk, and then try to drive. So you have to put all of those things in context. And so when we take the context of Isaiah chapter number 28, we know for a fact that it was dealing with how to understand doctrine. How do we know that? The context is the things that surround the text, that which is just before the text and that what comes after the text. Right. So now uh, if we want to take the immediate context of Isaiah, uh, which you have the immediate context and you have the extended context as well. Uh, did I do uh, Isaiah? Isaiah chapter number 28. Okay, so now we have this Isaiah chapter number 28. We have a clue in the immediate context. Uh, if we start at, um, we, first of all, we want to start, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. we want to start at verse number uh, 20, I mean, 28 and verse 6. And for a spirit of judgment, so we're talking about choosing the right path here, judgment, to him that sitteth in judgment right to the judges and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate but they also have erred the people that's supposed to be teaching and judging that those that sit at the principal seats at the gate the judges where the judges sit at they, they they're messed up they, they have erred through wine and through strong drink are what out of the way it's now you you you, you jesus talked about this way the mashiach talked about this way um, and, and, and it's important that, you know, I, I'm not going to get into it today, but that's an important, uh, note, uh, 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 highlight in this text as well to let you know that he's talking about, he's given directions, right? He's given directions. <clears throat> the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. Once again, it's repeated in the same verse. So you know that I, it has to be important. They are out of the way. What is the way? What is the way? That's important. Through strong drink, they err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Once again, they stumble in making and choosing the right path because that's the concrete uh, Hebraic perspective for that word judgment there for all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Now, here is the immediate context, immediate, not the next chapter, not, you know, uh, in which we're going to get into the previous chapter and after chapter if we have time here. But it's telling you here the context. Verse nine, whom shall he teach knowledge? This is not hard. This is not rocket science tree. You don't need a degree in hermeneutics and 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 and, and exegesis and textual criticism and and all of that. You don't need that. All you need is fifth grade elementary school reading comprehension. Isaiah chapter number twenty eight, verse nine. Number one. This is Isaiah speaking. This is Isaiah. This is not Ephraim speaking. This is Isaiah speaking. Whom shall he? He who the Most High teach knowledge. And whom shall he who the most high make to understand doctrine or teaching, right? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be, must be is not in the original text. This is an addition added by the scribes of the King James, the translators of the King James Version. Must be is not in the original text. Neither is a pun. It actually says for uh, precept to precept, Precept to precept, line to line, line to line, here a little, there a little, 
The word two means to compare. So laws must be compared to laws and principles must be compared to principles. And when you do the etymology of, of that, that word line, uh, you're going to find out it means to bind up. To bind up, to use a cord, to bind up. And so putting those two, uh, uh, um, you know, this helps you understand that he's absolutely giving a prescription for how to what? Understand knowledge. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? So the theory that Christians use to say, well, this is not. And even some of these translators, I think it's the Blue Letter Bible says, well, this was uh, uh, the uh, the prophet. They admit that the prophet was speaking, but he was uh, mimicking uh, Ephraim. Talk, that's nonsense, according to the simple context here. That's called eisegesis. That's called folk writing their own preconceived uh, dogmas into the text, trying to twist the text. This text says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? So the mindset of Isaiah at this moment is, is, is teaching knowledge and helping the people to understand doctrine. Them that are weaned from the breast, uh, them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast for precept. Now, like I said, they put this in there, must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line a line, here a little, uh, there a little. If we go, we know that, like I said, that this context here uh, is dealing with understanding, understanding the precepts of God. If we just go back one chapter, I'm not going to go all the way back. I'm going to go one chapter back. And uh, I think it's the 11th verse that I want. Uh, 27 and 11. I think that's it. Um, when the borrow, when the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire. For it is a people of no understanding. Right. Therefore, he had made them. Therefore, he that made them will not have mercy on them. And he that formed them uh, will show them no favor. So this is two verses before the end of the that, that before the beginning of chapter number 28. So it's definitely contextually relevant to what we're talking about. And what's being established here is understanding not doctrine and, and how to teach knowledge. If you jump over to the 29th chapter, uh, it gets even more clearer. You ask, was it clearer or did we, 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 we need, this is a precept. This is a precept and uh, in and of itself. It says, um, all throughout the 29th chapter, he talks about um, understanding. Let me get to the pertinent points because I've been going on here for a minute and I appreciate you allow, allowing me to uh, make my point here. Uh, verse number uh, uh, Isaiah 29, we begin at verse number nine. Stay yourselves in wonder, cry ye and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For Yahuwah have poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, have he covered. And the vision and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. Here we go. Learned, unlearned, uh, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Right. Wherefore, Yahuwah said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth. This was quoted by uh, the Mashiach, whom you guys call Jesus Christ. I believe it was Acts chapter number 15. I mean, uh, Matthew chapter number 15. Don't quote me on that, but somewhere it's in Matthew. Wherefore, Yahuwah said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me, their worship, is taught by the precept of men. So now the precept 
of, of the most high is being contrasted with the precept of men. The, the people, uh, uh, we know this, uh, Mashiach told the Pharisees, he said, you make the, the, the worship of God of none effect by your tradition, because you're putting your tradition, the precepts, the teachings of men, the laws of men over, you know, the, the that which was written, that which was spoken by the mouth of the prophets. Uh, and this was the complaint. And so my point in going here is, is showing you that the whole text from 26 all the way over to 29, and that's just what I, I prepared for my study, and 30 as a matter of fact, 30 as well. When you go into 30 as well, I did uh, get 30. Is all dealing with understanding, understanding the, the doctrines and teachings of the Most High. I got one more scripture. It should be in here in this same passage, and I, I, I get it, uh, one or two. It said, okay, we'll, we'll just continue on. Uh, Isaiah 29, remember that marvelous work in Deuteronomy? Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among his people. I meant Exodus. Even a marvelous work and wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. We're still talking about wisdom, understanding, knowledge. That is the context of this passage. That is the atmosphere in which Isaiah 28 and 10 is emerged. And that's just the, the logical fact. And understanding of the prudent men shall be here. There we go again with that word understanding. Isaiah 29 and 15. Woe to them that seek deep to hide their counsel. Their what? Their counsel from Yahuwah and their works in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Surely your timing of things, upside, your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it? He had no understanding. Uh-oh. Look at that word understanding again. Uh, and, I, and in that day, uh, verse uh, 18, and in that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall be. So we're talking about understanding. If you continue on, and I'm not for the end. Matter of fact, I'll read the last verse. Isaiah 29 and 24. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understand understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine so there we go again how to learn doctrine how, how the most high teaches is the context of isaiah chapter number 28 the logical the logical context uh okay so i was wondering uh how does one determine the precept and line for a particular subject i don't think i understand your question so let's say that it's it were we're studying a subject and the subject is not apparent. So you have to use precept upon precept. Now, uh, earlier when you were demonstrating precept upon precept, you kind of jumped from one book to the next book. So my question is, how does one determine what is the precept <coughs> of this particular subject? Yeah, I, I, I thought I illustrated that the reason that we jump from one book uh, to another book is because we had to go get the law. There is no law in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. I mean, it's some law contained in it, but 1 Corinthians is not the law. It's not the precept. Uh, Acts is not the precept. Where did we start off? We started off um, uh, Isaiah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then we went to Acts. I think we started off in Acts. I can't even remember. But uh, the point being is you have to go get the precept especially when you're in the New Testament. If you're in the New Testament and you're dealing with an issue of eating things sacrificed for idols, that's not in the Old Testament. You won't find that commandment in there. Thou shalt not eat things sacrificed to uh, eat uh, meat that has been sacrificed to idols. You won't find that in there. What you will find in there is the practice of idolatry. And so you ask the question is, if it's not clear, then how do you find it? Uh, 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 all praises be to the most high that today we have such a thing as a concordance. Right now, I'm on Blue Letter Bible. What you, if you type in the word meets uh, things, sacrifice to idols, you're going to get or you do a cross reference. If you, we, you have what's called a treasure. of. I'm going to give you an example. You have a treasure of what's called a treasure of scripture knowledge. I have my screen. I'm not sure if it's still sharing. I think it is. But if you click on it and you click on cross-reference, it'll give you scriptures, 
not always uh, accurate. It doesn't give you everything that, but it's a good starting place. And it's called the treasure for scripture knowledge. And it's going to link you and cross-reference you. Also, the Thompson Chain Bible is pretty uh, good with that as well, as being able to link uh, 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 principles, concepts, themes, and ideas, uh, you know, across uh, the Bible. And that's pretty much what you're doing. You're doing a uh, subjective search. So when, uh, like, again, when I couldn't find, um, I, I had some brethren say, well, hey, listen, Paul is an apostate. I, I I can prove it. Acts 15 says this. Paul says something different. And I said, well, let me take a look at it. And when I looked at it, I couldn't find any uh, Old Testament, uh, any law stating that you just can't eat. Uh, thou shalt not eat, eat uh, meat sacrificed to idols. So what I had to do is look at the context that it that was in it when I went to Exodus. That's why I went to Exodus 34. Because that's the fir very first time that you find the mention of eating things sacrificed with idols. The second time, which I skipped over for the interest of time, I mean, the second witness, because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, is Numbers chapter number 25. The people sit down. They begin to commit whoredoms with the children of Moab. They, they, they sat down to eat. They rose up to play. They, they, they ate uh, 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 things sacrificed to idols. Same context, uh, idolatry. So that's how I was able to say, okay, here's a principle that I can't find the law for. So I have to, you know, uh, look at this principle and go through eating meat. I think that's what I typed in, eating meat or meat sacrifice idols. I forget what I typed in initially, uh, initially to start. And it'll bring up every scripture that deals with that. And so uh, every Bible verse or scripture that deals with that. And so what you do is go to the law. The, the only place the law is, is in uh, the Old Testament. So uh, you have to go back there and pick up the law. And um, furthermore, Paul told you, that, uh, well, whoever the author of 2 Timothy, uh, I think it's 3 and 16, told you that all doctrine, all scripture is uh, to be heaped up, all, all Old Testament scripture is to be compiled for doctrine. So all of your teaching is supposed to come from the Old Testament, according to 2 Timothy chapter number three, verse uh, uh, 16. Also Acts chapter number 17, verse number 11. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the Old Testament daily to see if those things were so. They check, they, they, they put Paul's doctrine to the test by going into the Old Testament. And this is why people have a problem with understanding the scriptures and misinterpreting the scriptures and eisegetically uh, uh, twisting the scriptures is because uh, according, just like Peter said in 2 Peter, the third chapter in verse 16, I think it is, uh, yeah, verse 16, that they twist the scriptures because they're unlearned. They're unlearned in the scriptures. Either they haven't heard it, uh, they didn't hear it good enough, they didn't, you know, or they're not rooted, uh, they're unstable or not rooted in the Old Testament. So the reason why you got to get out of one book and go to another book, notice I stayed on the subject. I just, just I, I didn't get to another book and go to a, 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 a go to another book that was totally uh, talking about something way different than what I was talking about. What I went to was the precept, the very first time that the Most High talked about eating meat sacrificed with idols, and it was in Exodus chapter number 34. The second time that we find that is in Numbers. The only two times that we find it mentioned is in Exodus uh, and in Numbers, which gives us two witnesses confirming the fact that this is the precept uh, for uh, uh, that that principle of eating meat sacrificed to idols. Hopefully that answers. Uh, answers your question so what do you do if uh you run into the situation where you come to a scripture and <clears throat> one person says um uh this text is apparent uh but maybe you say no it's not apparent you have to use precept upon precept like is there any way to get on the same page or at that point do you just kind of have to agree to disagree like i said the context You always have the context there and you have to take the context into account, just like I did. You got to take what was said before. What was he talking about? What was the purpose? You know, 
the, the object of Bible study is to get to the author's intended meaning, not what somebody said, Bishop so-and-so, great scholar, commentator, uh, John, uh, uh, John MacArthur, whoever, uh, it, it's, it's not talking about that. When you get into, uh, uh, the scriptures interpret themselves and you have to use scripture to interpret scriptures and the scriptures must line up and they can't conflict each other. That's what precept upon precept means. If I put this precept, if I go here and look at this principle, the principles in the New Testament, if they're not aligning up with that which was spoken and the laws that was given, uh, then I know that this cannot be sound doctrine. Sound doctrine has to be based on two out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. This is uh, in accordance with the Old Testament and the New Testament. Paul himself said this. Paul himself said this. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, this is a precept. This is a precept. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Every word be established. And so you got to have two or three witnesses. And uh, 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 Isaiah tells you, and second, the, whoever the author of Second Timothy was, uh, says that uh, uh, you must rightly divide the word. Rightly dividing means to draw a line and put it in its proper uh, category so that you can understand it. If you're gonna if you're gonna take up a subject of biology, you 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 you're gonna put a biology in your Google search. You're not gonna put up. You, you're not gonna look up. Uh, 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 mechanics. I, I mean, that, that would be uh, illogical. So it's the same principle with the Bible. If you're dealing with love, then you need to go and see what the concrete definition is in the law. How does the law say you love your brother? How does the law say you love the most high? That's how you know what love is. This is why you get out of the Greek abstract, the Greek abstract, which lends to, oh, you can have your opinion. I can have my opinion. No, there's no scripture that's of any private interpretation. The, 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 the object of Bible study is to get to what the author who wrote it, the, the person that was speaking, meant when they said it and how the people that was there would understand that. And in order to do that, you got to get into the context, which deals with the his history behind it. And, you know, besides the internal evidence, which is the contextual, you know, the chapters before, the chapters after, the verses before, after, that sort of stuff, but also the context, the time period, what was going on during that time, understanding the Hebrew culture, how would this person be thinking? What would they mean by this term righteous? What would they mean? What did they mean by the way? What? How would they have understood when Isaiah said precept to them? What would they uh, thought? When, when the apostles were speaking of the New Testament, what was, of, of scripture in the New Testament, what were they talking about? What did they mean? Not how we've come to understand it today and how we've included the New Testament into the, the so-called canon of scripture and all of that. Uh, you know, it, when you look at it uh, in its, um, um, I think one of the first uh, principles I learned in Bible college was uh, observation, interpretation, and application. The three processes to exegesis. Observe exactly what the text say. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away. Don't try to put your understanding. Just read what the text say and try to uh, get the simplest uh, literal interpretation, literal understanding of that uh, text that you can. Uh, uh, interpretation is okay. We're trying to get at get into the mind of the author and see what he meant by it. application is okay. Now, how does this break down to me? How do I apply this uh, today? And that's what Bible study is all about. It's about getting to the author's intended meaning and not saying, oh, well, you have your opinion. I have mine. Now, there's many different ways that we can arrive at the same conclusion. Math can be done, you know, simple math uh, 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 can be done in different ways. Um, you know, you might, you know, put yours in columns. I might do mine, you know, one line, one plus one equals two, whatever it is. You might put the one on top of the two and put the plus beside the two and draw your line under the two. I mean, but it, it still the fact remains, as long as you come up to the right conclusion, then it's kind of irrelevant what method that you use. 
The problem is, is that we're not coming to the right conclusion, like you said. And then therefore, the Bible, the scriptures, the Old Testament has to be the final authority. And this is what this is telling you. That's what the apostles told you. And this is what this prophet Yeshayahu, uh, whom um, you guys call Isaiah, said as well. So I noticed that basically from about the time that, you know, Moses recorded his books up until the time that the writing of Isaiah was recorded, there would have been about a 700 year period. So I'm wondering about in this 700 year period, do you believe that everything that uh, Israel had in scripture was apparent or there was just a bunch of stuff that was a mystery to them because they didn't have the revelation of precept upon precept yet? Evidently, they didn't have the precept upon precept because we're talking, like you said, 700 years later, uh, you know, during the time of Isaiah. So and Isaiah is complaining that they still didn't have understanding, even though that the word of the, of the Most High was unto them precept upon precept here a little there a little like a little baby. Let me just give you bits and pieces of that. I'm not going to, you know, give you the whole steak. I'm going to, you know, get, uh, cut you a little piece of steak. I'm going to mix it up with some 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 cabbage and all of that because if I don't mix the steak in with the with the 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 the, the peas, you're not going to eat the peas. So I'm going to So that's how you treat children and they still weren't learning because they were drunk. The issue wasn't the method, the issue was the folk. I see. Uh, let's see here. Um, well, I guess kind of to continue on that question, uh, you know, because before that point, right, God probably sent them at least, uh, let me see if I can consult my, so, you know, uh, Joel would have came to them, uh, the prophet Joel, Hosea, Jonah, uh, Amos and Micah, right. They all would have been, you know, prior to, uh, Isaiah's time. And I guess kind of, why do you believe that God, sent prophets to Israel when he knew that they wouldn't be able to understand what uh, they were saying? Well, Israel as a whole didn't understand, but uh, certainly the prophets understood uh, because they were doing uh, uh, the communicating. They were warning Israel uh, against breaking the covenant. And so certainly they understood. Certainly David had some level of understanding. I'm not saying they were complete in their understanding because we know that they were not. Um, uh, because, the, the, you know, the, the full revelation of the Most High's marvelous work that he spoke about, I'm going to do this strange thing that he spoke about. No, they didn't understand that to the fullest intent. But they understood that uh, precept must be upon precept, that you have to compare uh, uh, doctrines and teachings to that which was spoken by the Most High. And that's the only way you get the truth, because I can give you my opinion. You can give your opinion. And then the next man come and have another opinion. You can go through 10 different commentary, Bible commentaries and get 10 different uh, paradigms, all which conflict with each other. All of them saying a different view about what happened here and what happened there and this, this and that. So if you wanted to, you could go and pick out the, 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 the commentator of your choice, which I've seen someone do on this very topic of precept upon precept. Uh, um, you know, down downplaying the, 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 the concept of precept upon precept, which was spoken by Isaiah. And he said that this was what the Most High was giving him to say uh, to the people. And the reason that they fell back, oh, well, they fell back. It was to them. And so it was a negative thing. It wasn't a positive thing. They fell back because they were drunk. They were out of the way. Is the way positive or negative? The way that the Most High established, the way that uh, Christ said, I am the way, the truth and I, is that now, is that way uh, crooked, uh, corrupted in any kind of way? No, it's not. So uh, the same way, the principle and precept of, of precept upon precept wasn't the issue. The issue was these folks was drunk and they and they was making bad decisions. They was uh, uh, choosing the wrong paths. They was off of the path. And so this was the uh, that was the issue then. Yeah, I well, because so here's the deal. Um, like I could understand, let's say that. Uh, you know, God only revealed these things so the prophets could understand them. I could get that. But then the question is, is that 
you know, God specifically sent, told these prophets, hey, go on to the people and say this stuff. And that's the part that doesn't make sense to me. You know, why is God telling the prophets to go and communicate this stuff to the people that they're not going to be able to understand? You right. Like now, a lot of people don't understand the laws when you in court either. You don't understand uh, uh, code, Comar Code Section 3.5, the judicial legislation uh, 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 history versus uh, uh, Sam Johnson, uh, Court of Appeal. Yeah, average person doesn't understand that either. But the fact that you've been told uh, of the law and that the law is available to you makes you uh, responsible to the law and absolves you of any uh, 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 reason not to keep it. Ignorance is not a, a reason to break the law. The law, if you break the law and you say, well, wow, I didn't know that that was the law. The judge going to tell you, well, it's public information. You can search the books just like the lawyers do. We're not going to, uh, ignorance of the law is not a defense or, uh, or a mitigating circumstance for breaking the law. So it's the same principle here. The most high lets you know, he makes you aware of it. And if you are spiritually minded, if you're not sleep, if you're if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, then you're going to receive that. That's what the scripture says. You're going to receive that. Uh, uh, what is it? Proverbs, I think it's 25 and two, somewhere around there, where it says that the, uh, the, uh, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search out a matter. So the most high takes pleasure in not making things so easy for you to obtain because that's not going to cause you to get strength and be strengthened and, and grow. What causes you to grow is resistance. What causes you to develop muscles and strength and, and, and so that you can work and defend defend yourself and your family. Uh, 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 that's, that's, that's what uh, the most high, it, it's, 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 it's resistance. It's not Everything is easy for you. I'm a layout. And so he says the secret things belong to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed are to us and to our children forevermore. And so um, the Most High has always wanted to reveal himself and is always willing to reveal himself. But it's the people who's caught up in their own traditions, their own cultures, their own uh, precepts and laws. They want to make up their own stuff uh, to go by. And this is why they don't hear. And so they won't have an excuse that they were not told. So this is why he sent the prophets to warn them. Listen, y'all made this covenant and now y'all are breaking it. And this is what's going to happen to you for breaking it. Just like I promised you. Yeah, I guess kind of here's, um, and I was curious kind of why you brought up the aspect of the law, because typically what I remember from most of the prophetic books, it's usually, you know, the prophets coming to them saying, hey, you know, you people are doing wicked things. Uh, you need to repent of that. Um, you know, uh, and then uh, these are, you know, these are some judgments that are coming upon you in your day. And then often he would give them promises, you know, of the future of things to come. So I guess I'm kind of curious why you brought up the aspect of law in regards to the messages that the you know because i don't remember the prophets necessarily coming and giving the people law so kind of why did you bring up law i brought up law because uh that's what the scripture says that's what the first century uh uh messiah said he said all things that's written in the law and the prophets so the prophets is coupled with the law uh, second Peter, the third chapter, he says, I came to put you in remembrance. I think it's verse number two of that which was spoken of by the holy prophets, all of the holy prophets, uh, Moses being a holy prophet as well, who gave the law. But he was just one of the, the uh, a plethora of Nebaim or prophets uh, that prophesied uh, during the time. And they absolutely prophesied the law. Uh, I think it's chapter number 30 in here. He specifically mentions the law uh, in this same context with this precept. So all throughout it, it all throughout the the, the, the the judgments of the prophets, they said, because you broke the law, you broke the covenant, you broke the agreement. And this is why you're being punished. Or repent and, and, and turn back to the covenant or you're going to be punished. You know, this was the words of the prophets. The prophets came and they spoke the word of the most high and how to keep the law and what would befall us if we do not. That's what they came for. So I'm I'm certainly at a loss to understand how you don't see that the prophets came speaking the law. They all spoke and, and, and judged 
uh, uh, Israel and um, Judah for not keeping the law. That's why. That's what the purpose of their message was. All of them. Well, let me uh, let me jump back on the uh, original topic. Uh, now, I assume that you believe that there is something set up to prevent precept upon precept from being misapplied. And if that is the case, uh, what is set up to prevent it from being misapplied? Or mis I mis think, Yeah. I don't think I understand your question, David. So, for example, like, um, you know, I, I could see a person using the precept upon precept method and just, you know, um, you know, going somewhere in the Bible that uses the same word and applying that to something in a different context, you know, that is unrelated and not talking about the same thing. Um, and so kind of my question is that uh, because it's kind of that open it seems like you could have two people, like we spoke about initially, right? Two people using precept upon precept and yet, you know, arriving at different um, areas. So kind of my question is that, are you aware of anything that actually prevents the precept upon precept method from being, you know, misused? Well, uh, yes, it, it tells you in the text that it has to be precept upon precept. You can take scriptures dealing with adultery and apply them to stealing. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. And that, uh, sadly, that's what a lot of people do. So what's set up is precept upon precept. You have to go back to the Bible and uh, to, the, to the law, to the scriptures, and get the law, the commandment, precept, get the instructions or the teachings, what was, what was taught. And that's how you uh, false doctrine. I just gave it to you. Paul told you as well. Uh, uh, also, whoever the right author of Second Timothy was, uh, uh, again, told you the same thing as well. That uh, Luke uh, 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 pretty much uh, told you as well that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they search the scriptures. They went through the Old Testament to find out to, uh, if what Paul was teaching was true. So we know Paul's writings had to be in line with the Old Testament or else these Jews, the Jews in the synagogue where Paul was at after he left, got kicked out by the Jews in Thessalonica. When he got to Berea, uh, they received him. They, they didn't give him a hard way to go. And they said, OK, we didn't heard your message. Now let us go to the Old Testament to make sure that what you're saying is the truth. And so that that's that 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 that's one uh, example. Also, like I said, Second Timothy chapter number three, verses fifteen and sixteen, talks about the scriptures. All scriptures is given by inspiration of the Alahayim and is profitable for doctrine. That word "profitable" goes back to the Greek root word. I think it's ophelimos or ophelos, uh, which means to heat up. And so all graphy, all Old Testament scripture must be compiled to make doctrine. So in other words, all doctrine must be compiled of the Old Testament scripture. So in order for me to test your doctrine, I'm going to run it by the Old Testament. That's what I'm going to do. And if it conflicts with any principle, any law in the Old Testament, then I know it's unsound doctrine. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, initially, you know, before we went on air, you were kind of asking me about, um, I believe you're asking basically about how uh, I understand scripture. So this would probably be a good time to explain that, uh, obviously, and it probably, you know, goes without saying, uh, but it's always good to say it. Um, you know, we should pray to God first and ask him for understanding of a particular passage. But uh, after that, um, and maybe this is stuff that you're doing and you didn't bother mentioning because we were discussing uh, precept upon precept. But uh, to me, it's simply, you know, you know, who's speaking, right? Who's the author? Uh, who are they speaking to? You know, if you can determine, you know, what uh, time period they're in, that way you kind of know what was going on at the time. And that way, when he says things, you, you know who he's regarding to uh, figure out, you know, what uh, what covenant uh, the people are in who are talking, right? Are they in the old covenant or the new covenant? Um, you know, uh, find out, 
you know, you could find out sometimes even where, where the, you know, where this thing was taking place is, uh, helpful. So I do all that. And, uh, and I don't know, it's kind of, I I'm, I'm looking at it and I guess I kind of almost, it would almost seem like when you, when you take that, you know, methodology to understanding scripture in the context that searching for a precept would be kind of unnecessary. At least that's just kind of how I see it. So, uh, I don't know if you had anything you want to say in regards to that. And if you're talking, you're muted. Well, 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 precept, uh, it, it, I just showed you the necessity of precept upon precept. A lot of people, and uh, uh, Peter talked about it in, uh, once again, 2 Peter chapter number 3, where he says that uh, people find the need to twist the scriptures, which is called the era of the wicked. Folks twist the scriptures because they are unlearned and unstable in the Old Testament. This is why they, they, they come up with doctrines that are uh, against the Old Testament and what you guys call the New Testament, the Brit Hadassah. So um, in fact, Christianity itself uh, as a whole, uh, uh, the doctrine itself is core doctrine conflicts that of the uh, uh, New Testament. Let alone let me, the old uh, testament. Let me sorry, let me jump in just one second because I wanted to look it up. Uh what was the part that you were talking about? And you said second Peter three. Do you know the verse? Second Peter chapter number three, verse number sixteen. All right, let me see here. So this one says, uh, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them concerning these things, in which some things hard to understand, which the unlearned and unsettled pervert, as also they do the rest of the scriptures to their own. Destruction. Yeah, I was looking it up because I heard you say something about Old Testament, and I was like, I don't remember that being in the verse, but uh, okay, you can continue with what you were saying. Right. The word scripture there uh, that Peter is using, here's another uh, reason why you need to uh, first understand context. A lot of people don't understand context, and they run off and say Peter called Paul's writing scripture. Uh, this is why you need to 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 understand how to go back and get the precepts. Here's another example. You asked why and you said you don't necessarily need it. It is absolutely needed with all of the false doctrines out there, with all the twisted and mangled uh, 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 dogmas and things of that nature. Uh, precept upon precept is most certainly needed. In this case, um, uh in this case here, in uh, the the uh, second uh, epistle of Peter, I'm trying to get caught up in my uh, paper Bible here. Um, in the um, second epistle of Peter, chapter number three, um, the, the reason why I said Old Testament here, because this is what Peter is referring to as scripture. Now, I'm going to show it to you real quick. And this is why a lot of people, this is a prime example of why you need to understand context and why you need to understand precepting as well. Uh, uh, first verse. Well, let's start reading off at uh, verse 16. As also in, 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 notice the word in, all his epistles, speaking in, once again, them of these things. What things? This to me is elementary school. You don't need a degree in theology and Bible study and Greek and Hebrew and all of that. It, it, it's simple. The subject of uh, 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 Second Peter chapter number three, verse 16 is these things. So now once we define these things, then we will have defined what Peter was calling scripture. I'm going to prove it to you. As also in all his epistles speaking in them, of these things, of these things, in which some things, some of these things that he's talking about, still talking about these things as the subject, hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unlearned and unstable, unlearned and unstable in what? In these things. Rest, as they do also the other scriptures. Well, what scripture is here to begin with? Is he talking about Paul's writing? Well, if you go to the context of this scripture, 
I mean, of this verse, you will find out that the use of the term scripture is referring to the Old Testament, the, the, the holy prophets that spoke about the day of the Lord. Well, how do you know that? You know, uh, 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 we start at verse number, start at verse number one, three and one. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So Peter is trying to get them to remember something here. Let's see what Peter is trying to get them to remember. The purpose of him writing this chapter is for to get somebody to remember something. In this case, it would be the scattered tribes throughout Asia Minor. Um, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of Adonai and Savior. So he's coming to get them in mind of the, the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and then turned around and commanded, the same word, commanded by the prophets, I mean by the apostles. I'm going to show it to you. Um, verse number four is the first, uh, well, let's go to verse number three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. So he's talking about some scoffers, same thing that Peter was talking about. And they're writing to the same geographical location, only Peter writing to, uh, only Peter writing to uh, the, the scattered tribes and Paul writing to the Gentiles, but in the same area and being exposed to the same conditions. And so verse number three, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. So we're talking about the last days context, scoffers come in the last days. Walking after their own lust, not walking after the words of the prophets. They're doing their own thing. They're making up their own stuff and saying, here's verse number four. This is our first hint. Uh, well, our second hint, our first hint was in uh, uh, verse number two, the words which were spoken by the holy prophets. Verse number four and saying, where is the promise of his coming? But since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. So what we're talking about is the promise coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord that was spoken of by the prophets. He's going to tell you this a few times in here. Um, and for this, they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of Elohim, there go that word again, the word of Elohim, um, that by the word of Elohim, uh, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, here we go again, by the same word. Notice, watch that thread thread itself through the whole text. What he's talking about is that which was spoken by the holy prophets and commanded by the apostles with, uh, uh, in regards to the day of the Lord. In regards to the day of the Lord. Um whereby the world that verse six verse seven but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment once again the day of the lord the day of the judgment uh, where do you find this at how can you prove this this is all throughout the tanakh which you guys call the old testament it's in the psalms it's in joel it's in isaiah that they talk about the day of the lord when the elements shall come and melt away with fervent heat this is what he's talking about and the heavens and the earth that are now the same word uh, verse number eight but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day verse number nine here go another key uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. So once again, we're talking about the promise of the coming of the Lord. But it's long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here we go. It doesn't get any pointer than this. Verse number 10. But the day of Yahuwah. Actually, this is Adonai. But the day of Adonai will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. This is all throughout the prophets. David prophesied about it. Uh, I think Moses prophesied about it. Don't quote me on Moses, but I'm sure Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Joel prophesied about it. Um, the, the, the shall melt away with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that there that are therein shall be burned up. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things, all what things? The day of the Lord, 
the delay so that salva folks can get salvation. That the uh, that's what he's talking about. Wherein the heaven being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise. What promise? The promise of his coming that was talked about a couple verses before. Look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for these things, what things? The day of the Lord coming, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. That's what these things. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the writing that uh, uh, Peter's talking about here. According to uh, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. So the subject of, of this uh, passage is the long suffering of our Lord. The, 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 the delay of the de day of the coming of the Lord, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you. So what he's talking about is not Paul's writings being scripture. He's talking about the scripture about the day of the Lord contained in Paul's writings. So this is why it's important that you have uh, understanding of the Old Testament. Now watch this. And, I, and I'm closing with this because I got to run. Verse 16, and also as in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. What things? The long suffering of the Most High for salvation, the, 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 the delay of the day of the Lord. That's what he's talking about. Speaking in them these things in which some things are hard to be understood, which they which are unlearned and unstable rest. So this is how we know that the scriptures that he's talking about here is dealing with those Old Testament scriptures, which speak about the day of the Lord, which the holy prophets spoke about, which Peter came to remind uh, uh, the, the diaspora uh, the, throughout Asia Minor of. That's how, this is why you need precept. And then to go to the precept, you go to the Old Testament uh, uh, scriptures that talk about the day of the Lord, Joel, Psalms, Jeremiah, Isaiah. And then that's how you understand what's being spoken here. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, thanks for breaking that down. Uh, we might not actually be that too far apart. It might just be, you know, you refer to something as a precept that I might call something else. So perhaps that might be of it, but I'd have to meditate on this a little bit more, but nevertheless, I appreciate you going into it. I've asked other people about this method before too, and they just like refused to go into it. So I'm glad that I finally got somebody who was willing to. So uh, before I close it off, uh, anything else you want to say? No, actually, um, I think, you know, that, like I said, uh, both uh, sides, Christians and um uh, those uh, whom are called Hebrew Israelites, if you will, uh, misuse this con uh, this this concept of precept upon precept because they and uh, they don't understand it, and that's why maybe why you 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 didn't get an answer uh, because they think a lot of them think that precept is just going to get a verse that looks like it agrees with you and 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 piling those verses together. That's not precept upon precept. Precept is when you go and get the statute, when you go and get the law, just like they do in the court of law. They, they go if there's some uh, uh, some arguments, some discrepancies, some disagreements. OK, where's the law? Where's the law? Let's go get a law and see what the actual law says. And that's what they do. They go to the law book and says, well, here's what the actual statute says versus what, you know, the attorney is a certain or. Uh, uh, or what have you. And so it's that's the same principle. And it's very important that we understand that precept because this is how the Most High has designed it for us to be able to understand not only the scriptures, but everything. If you continue to read on in that 28th chapter, he talks about sowing uh, 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 sowing seeds, dill seeds, cumin seeds, and wheat. Same principle. 
He said that the most high is teaching you that way. You draw a line, you draw lines, you measure out the lines and you put the seeds in, in, in there. According to uh, you, you, you put the wheat with the wheat, the barley with the barley, the corn with the corn. Yeah, that, that's how you do that. The fruit with the fruit, line upon line, precept upon precept. You don't mix the wheat with the with, with the strawberries. You don't mix the wheat with the grapes. You know, you you put them in a line and you put them in their rows and in their proper perspective. And that can, carries out throughout that chapter. So hopefully I've helped uh, you to understand or someone to understand, you know, the importance of uh, the uh, biblical mandate for precept upon precept, which was uh, confirmed in the New Testament, uh, which is called rightly dividing. That's why I went there in 2 Timothy, because that's the same thing that the author of 2 Timothy was speaking of and rightly dividing. He was saying, place the, the, the place things in their proper uh, uh, category, precept upon precept. So I appreciate your time. You've been a, a great uh, host. Um, you know, um, the, the, the platform was very peaceful. And um, like I said, I hope the Most High has... Uh, been a blessing, um, used me to be a blessing to uh, someone and, um, you know, appreciate you having me on. Cool. Peace, everybody. All right. Peace.